So here's a morbid question for you. Have you ever considered the exact circumstances of your own death? Have you thought about how you would or wouldn't like to die? It's probably the most sobering thought you can possibly have. We will all eventually die, and so will everyone we know. Everyone we love, every friend you have will die, and so will every enemy, every famous person will die. And so too will every person of power, importance or influence. Death comes to all. Yet despite being one of the very few common experiences that link every human being on this earth, both past and present, death and all the rituals surrounding it is often considered taboo. It's a topic of conversation where many of us choose to tread rather carefully or simply avoid altogether. On Time to Talk tonight, our panel will be kicking the can around, so to speak. I think we elected not to kick a bucket as we explore the topic of death and the many issues relating to it. And before we begin, we do issue a warning that people sensitive to discussions about death or dying may choose to avoid our conversation tonight. Anyone struggling with issues relating to death, perhaps their own mortality or grief surrounding the loss of someone close, you have the choice to turn this off now. And if you are struggling to cope, I'd personally encourage you to consider confiding in somebody that you trust or perhaps a service such as Lifeline, which can be reached on 13 11 14. Leanne, Tracy and Michelle join me tonight. Welcome, ladies. Hi, Hi Tim. Team. Great to have you all in. Why is death such a taboo topic, particularly in Australia? Why do we struggle to talk about this experience which we all go through, we're all touched by, usually multiple times in our lives? Why is death so taboo? Mm, is it that we, we don't want to think about our own mortality? Bit of fear, you reckon? Mm. People get so upset by it, you know. Mm. So if you start the conversation around it, you're likely to, um, you know, bring up sad memories and maybe then have someone crying and it's you know leads to that sort of thing so and then it's we difficult to deal with it. someone someone else being upset yeah as mm -hmm. well australians mm. are pretty happy-go-lucky too aren't we sometimes we're not prepared to take on things that are particularly serious are we leanne yeah everybody um <clears throat> would much rather be looking at life and and the future rather than um looking at death and be probably because we all are all going to die we don't want to look at it, perhaps. Mm. So that begs the question, is there a need? Do we need to be talking about death more often or can we just carry on the way that we do in Australia, which is to really <laughs> bury our heads in the sand and just not explore it at all? Well, I've noticed lately that there's been a lot of ads on TV for funeral insurance, which, like, more so than That's I true, ever remember. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. So I guess yeah. more people... Um, and, and the aim of the, the angle of the ad is to save your family being stuck with the <laughs> cost of it. I find those ads really morbid. I'm, I'm a typical Australian, obviously, because when they come on, I'm not offended, but I think, oh, gee whiz, do we have to listen to this mm. man going onto the golf course talking about <laughs> how he might drop dead? Yeah, like, I, I feel I, about the same way. No, I, see, mm. I, I find them practical. Mm. Well, I don't want my family worrying about, you know, costs of funeral or, or how they're going to survive after I'm gone. So for me, it, it's practical and it's something, you know, said before, should we should we talk about death? Well, yeah, we should talk about death more. Mm. Mm. When my husband and, saw that ad the other night, he goes, well, what makes you think that I'm going to pay for your funeral anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Into the compost heap, with mm. you? Yeah. Mm. And, and I'm a baby boomer, and I think those ads are aimed at my age group. And, um, yeah, I don't have a problem with it, mm. it, except that there are so many to choose from. There are. <laughs> Which and and will they, do? Will they still be in business when yeah. I die? But you know? you know what, Leanne? While you choose, there's always a hot cup of coffee and a Tim Tam, apparently, according to those ads. So you can consider in comfort and style. Oh, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's really the finality of death. When it comes to death, there's no uh, sidestepping your way around it. There's no negotiating. There's no bargaining. And for those people who, like me, if you have a bit of a creative mind and you don't think black and white, that cold, blunt finality of death can be really confronting. I mean, it, let's consider the definition of death for a moment. This sends, sends a shiver up my spine, okay? I'm just being honest. Mm. I don't like mm. to explore death myself, which is why we're doing the show tonight. <laughs> Death begins when the heart stops beating. Deprived of oxygen, a cascade of cellular, cellular deaths commences, beginning with brain cells and ending with your skin cells. Death is a process rather than an event. Specifying the moment of death usually involves deciding on a point from which there can be no return. So final. So mm -hmm. awful. Mm -hmm. Very final. I saw 
a show on TV last week um, in which they actually showed a man dying and the man was 84 um, and he had I think cancer of the liver and somewhere else and he chose to be filmed he knew you know and they gave a warning you know that it might upset people and he was extremely anemic and they were explaining in a scientific manner how his red blood cells were no longer able to carry oxygen so his heart had to work harder and he got weaker and weaker and it was it was quite sort of cold and clinical but not without feeling either and mm. they showed like his last gasping few breaths and then he just didn't take another one mm. and his family were with him around the bed and it may be sort of a bit sad and teary but it was really quite sort of personal and touching mm. as well it wasn't horrible or i didn't feel like an awful voyeur watching it or it, it was really it sounds was like that show really humanized it and made Mm. death seemed what we, actually what it is which is a natural process yeah, yeah. I, was, I almost didn't watch it when i saw it advertised because i thought i felt like a bit of a ghoul watching someone die but i'm really glad i did mm. i know leanne you're quite passionate about the idea of making sure that death isn't taboo for example there are people listening to this right now thinking this isn't something that should be on the radio we shouldn't be discussing this and i know that you feel quite the opposite it's important to to yeah. talk openly about these things yeah, I mean, if we if we hide these things, it it only adds more mystery and mm. more fear. I think, mm. you know, mm. and and I've had the privilege to be with three friends, or, or yeah, with two friends when three babies have been born. Okay, so I've been there at the start, and I was with a, a friend the morning after she brought her baby home from hospital to die. And that was such, just as powerful as the births. Incredible experience and, and such a privilege to be allowed to be there, you know. And this particular baby had been in hospital for uh, 10 weeks and had struggled for life the whole time and finally uh, it was decided to bring Bub home on, on machinery. And um, I was able to, to say to the mum, wow, she looked just like you, mm. you know. Nobody, not many people had been able to do that because nobody had seen her. She'd been in hospital all that time in special care and, mm. or in intensive care probably, and it's a long time ago now. Um, so, you know, that, that was a deeply moving experience, but here was this little, gorgeous little baby and in her own bed for the first time with the sun streaming in on her for the first time, and it was just a real privilege to be there and so lovely. So rather than being traumatised by being part of something like that, you carry that as a very special treasured yeah, memory. Yeah. I, I, I learnt a while ago, um, after my brother died, um, I was actually involved with ten parents that lost babies at different stages, some while they were still pregnant, some as old as 20 months. And I learnt back then that you just got to face it and deal with it and talk about it. You know, once upon a time, bodies would be in the drawing room of the home and the whole family would be there and, you know, they'd make sure that the person really was dead because mm. sometimes they'd get some disease and, and they'd more wake people up. Died you know? in their own home in <laughs> their, with their family around yeah. them rather than just in hospital. So whereas now mm. we've got like institutions and everything sort of shut away and, and we've like sanitised death Absolutely. completely. I mean, some, someone else will mm. come in and take over the procedure and, and mm. take care of everything and you know but the family yeah. essentially really have, have nothing to do except grieve. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah so it, you're right. And we're going to be talking about rituals surrounding you know after somebody dies because mm. that's interesting what you say there about not viewing the body and, mm. and really being quite removed from mm. the person once they died and I don't know how healthy that is to be honest but you know mm. I suppose it's a matter of striking a balance so I think we've established that death can cause us possibly the worst emotional trauma mm. we're ever likely to experience so given that it is such a traumatic sensitive area I want to explore where humor can fit in with with all of this when John Cleese's elderly mother was still alive he often used to say that when she died he intended to have her stuffed and mounted so he could sit her on the mantelpiece and to me that's extremely funny but I'm a little bit strange so in a general sense I am interested to know can we make light of death at all is it is or indeed illness or perhaps for stages of dying is there humor in this 
there, there's a great scene in Meet the Parents where the um, the ashes the ashes on the um, what do you call it about the fireplace mantelpiece mm. and um, yeah they, they get spilt and it's it's really it's funny. very inappropriate but I don't think oh, I think most people scene. laugh yeah yeah, yeah. it's very funny that sort of thing we're quite in our family we we cope with stress using humour in a mm. humongous way in probably what outsiders would think was a really inappropriate rude offensive way but if it's okay in your family then. Within the family context, well, then, mm. then it's okay. Yeah. Were you talking about those really the, the jokes that go around after a big tragedy? Yes, those kinds of things. Well, where do we draw the line? Whenever a celebrity dies, mm. for example, the internet Before lights minutes, up. You've got yep. uh, text, text messages. messages yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me put this one to you. When Princess uh, Diana, the Princess mm. of Wales, died, there were a number of jokes. I'm going to share one tonight. What was the last thing to go through Diana's mind before she died? Screen. The radiator. Mm. Oh. Uh, is that <laughs> offensive? No. Not not now. Maybe straight after it might have. Been. So it's a matter of timing. I think oh. so. I think like after nine eleven, you wouldn't have heard a single joke about that. Mm. There's probably the odd one now. Well, it's interesting. It's not only about timing because we, when Osama bin Laden died more recently, I received a text message within minutes, I reckon, of of mm. that news going to air. Um, which asked me if I'd heard of the new Starbucks coffee, the Osama Bin Latte. Did any of you hear this? No. It was reported to no. have a fluffy white head with a double shot in it. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> so, no, he's really hated and Princess no, Diana no. was really loved. See, I don't, and... I don't think either of them are okay. I don't like either of them. I think they're, they're both mm. in poor taste. I, I, just, I don't like jokes. And that's just my personal opinion. I just go, I do the groan thing. Mm. Oh, that's really not funny. I'm was particularly offended by all the Princess Diana ones, and I don't know because I just, you know, really I don't know if I admired or I just I just loved her. She was just beautiful, mm. and so I was really offended by all of those when it first mm. happened. And I still don't like them. No. And then the Osama bin Laden one, I'm a bit like you. I, it doesn't upset me that he's dead at all, but the jokes are a bit off. Yeah, you know, mm. yeah, mm. a bit off. Okay. Yeah, so no poor taste jokes. No. We talk about humour being a um, a way of people coping with grief or even shock. Jokes like that in this modern age with social media and text mm-hmm. messaging, isn't that particularly young people send these texts around? Mm. Is it all right? Is it a coping? Me- is it an acceptable coping mechanism for younger people to use? Oh Lord, no. I think think coping with like distancing themselves from the event that Mm -hmm. that's happened. Mm. Yeah, and and I think you'll find that there's such a variety of people on this planet Mm. that you're not going to be able to make everyone happy. Exactly. Mm. I have a terrible habit of saying to people if I like. You know, like, I love that hat, Tim. Can you give me that when you die? Or can you leave me that in your will? <laughs> I say it all the time. Yeah. And I guess I've probably till now haven't really stopped and think. I wonder if people are offended by that. <laughs> can you Is leave me that in me your off will? for the hat? <laughs> exactly. It's, Watch your back, Tim. I guess that's a bit of a... But it's a compliment as well, mm. isn't it? Mm. I yeah, I really hat. like your hat. Yeah. So can you leave me that in your I love your hat yeah. so much I'm willing to kill you for it. <laughs> you might be taking it to extremes, <laughs> Michelle, but, you know. Well, look, yeah. he, here's a clip about death as performed by comedian George Carlin. Have a little listen to this. So you know what I've been doing? Going through my address book and crossing out the dead people. <laughs> you do that? That's a lot of fun, isn't it? Gives you a good feeling. Kind of gives you a feeling of power. A superiority to have outlasted another old friend. But you can't do it too soon, you know. You can't do it too soon. You can't come running home from the funeral and get the book out, you know, and be looking through the book. You can't do that. A little time has to pass. You have to let a little time go by. I have a rule of thumb, six weeks. If you're a friend of mine and you're in my book and you die, I leave you alone for an extra six weeks. Six extra weeks in the book on the house, it's on me. Now, speaking of dead people, there are things we say when someone dies. Most of us say, a lot of us do. Things we say that no one ever questions. They just kind of go unexamined. Give you a couple examples. Uh, After someone dies, the following conversation is bound to take place probably more than once. Two guys meet on the street. Hey, did you hear? Phil Davis died. Phil Davis? I just saw him yesterday. Yeah. (laughs) Didn't help. (laughs) He died anyway. 
Apparently, the simple act of your seeing him did not slow his cancer down. In fact, it may have made it more aggressive. You know, you could be responsible for Phil's death. How do you live with yourself? Uh, George Carlin there. Interesting to know if you found that amusing or not. Perhaps you can give us a call tonight on 65853456. Ladies, do any of you recall your first experience of death? Obviously not your own. Uh, for many of us, like me, it starts off with a pet. 